speaking with uh, Jeff Verona, which is an extra treat uh, because he happens to be one of my truly favorite composers who I've been listening to since I was uh, very young. Uh, Jeff is behind the music of films like Ridley Scott's White Squall, Exit Wounds, the very beautiful score to A Thousand Roads, uh, hit shows like Homicide, Chicago Hope, uh, the best-selling video game God of War 3, and also composed the breathtaking regatta suite for the 2008 Olympics regatta, among many other things. He is now composing the upcoming thriller Phantom, starring Ed Harris and David Duchovny. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for your time today. It's a, a real honor. It is such a pleasure to be here with you. So to start off, uh, your music resonates with me a lot, and I think listeners can just feel how personal <coughs> your scores are and how much of, a, of yourself you imprint onto the music. What does music mean to you, and why did you decide on the film and TV scoring path? Well, um, you know, I never really thought about music <clears throat> as what I wanted to do uh, as I was growing up, going to school. I was very focused on being a photographer, being an artist. Mm -hmm. um, but I started to realize that, that I couldn't take a picture of what I thought was really beautiful because what I found beautiful were how moments changed in time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's something that's hard uh, to capture in, in photography or, or, or art. But I'd been playing music and I, you know, I was interested in, in, I was sort of drawn to kind of uh, more unusual music. I started to work a lot with uh, dance companies and dancers and choreographers and I spent many years writing music for choreography, which I learned that um, dancers listen to music differently than musicians do, and I preferred their way. Hmm. Uh, they, they heard music in terms of velocity and weight, and I thought that was quite beautiful. And then along the, along the way, um, I, I, I met somebody who was a, a film score fanatic. I mean, had a massive collection. I had never heard of film music before. I, I didn't know anything about it. And... Um, and then suddenly I got introduced to Jerry Goldsmith oh, wow. and Bernard Herrmann. Yeah. And um, I, I found myself incredibly moved. So I started to pay more attention. And um, eventually I became uh, very, very uh, accomplished at, um, at technology, music technology, sampling when it was quite new, mm -hmm. sequencing when it was new. Uh, so I became a, a studio musician doing programming for, for, for albums, uh, for uh, tours, um, drum programming, working with record producers. But eventually I real I, it just got to the point where all of my, my clients were film composers. Mm -hmm. And I found myself kind of suddenly in film school that I started to see films in a very different way. I started to listen to music in a different way. I started to learn uh, about the, the, the methods by which film music was made, and I loved it. And that led me towards um, getting to write a cue here, a cue there, do a little bit of ghosting, and then eventually uh, just being handed off uh, scores that somebody else couldn't do, right. and which is actually how White Squall came about. That was just... There was a, it was sort of an emergency situation where <clears throat> um, the, uh, uh, the director had come to a parting of the ways with a composer, but, um, but the film had to be finished at Disney, at, uh, right where you're sitting. Um, and, uh, and so uh, Ridley had gone to Hans Zimmer, and I, he and I shared a studio at the time. And he said, I, I have a problem. I need somebody to score this movie now. It, we're, we're mixing in three weeks. Wow. And Hans said, I can't do it. But I think this guy, he's, 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 this is his style of music. And I already started to develop a style that was based on um, world music because I had done some traveling and listening and playing instruments. Uh, ambient music, I'd already been doing some work with Brian Eno and John Hassel right, yeah. and doing an album uh, with them and some touring with them. And, and having worked with dance and just all of those elements, uh, some of them quite quirky, uh, were sort of came together. And from there, I've just been exploring those, those elements of traditional music, orchestral music, um, electronics, 
and and world music in a way that you know to this day still fascinate me excite me um you know uh with every score uh my job isn't to imprint my own uh fascinations it's to find uh, a way to complete a director's vision in a way that we all find uh, mutually satisfying. Mm-hmm. So a director is going to choose me because they've heard something in my work that that um, excites them or intrigues them or they feel some sort of a kinship with. Now I've written music for for you know I've written orchestral music, I've written electronic music, I've 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 written a very a varied body of 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 music. So there are different things that will excite different people in different ways, but but they all come from the same center. You know what I mean? They're right. they're, they're sort of uh, uh, spokes that all come from the same hub, but lead into different uh, directions. Mm-hmm. So when so, you approach a project, uh, what's the first thing that grabs you? Is it the the story, the characters, the setting, editing, cinematography? I mean, it's a combination of everything. But what, what's what's the main aspect of a film that really sparks your creativity the most and gets you writing? I think that the best thing is when a director sits down Mm. and tells you the story in their own words. Because a director, whether they've written it or not, and it's usually, usually they haven't, but in Mm -hmm. in the case of Phantom, uh, the director was also the writer. Um, And uh, to sit with... Uh, with a director just in their living room or over a cup of coffee or or something and have them tell you the story from their perspective and their words from start to finish, you you can start to get why they wanted to spend five years of their life making a movie. And that's usually how long it takes a director to get a movie made. So once, once I've heard them tell the story, then I understand the perspective. I understand what the characters mean to him, to, to the director, him or her. Um, I understand how the plot moves in their mind. Mm-hmm. So once I have that, and I start to get a sense of what they enjoy about music, they might tell me something that they've been listening to of mine. Maybe they're listening to a Ry Cooter album. Maybe they're listening to other film scores. Maybe they're listening to, you know, ancient uh indonesian music you know whatever between knowing what the director is thinking in their head sort of roughly about music and usually they do you know nobody's coming at this with you know i don't know what do you want to do that's that's fairly rare usually they say you know i'm looking for a score that feels like this and sometimes they'll be more specific about uh instrumentation or orchestration do they want something traditional do they want something electronic do they want something guitar driven something uh modern with a you know a you know a idm f- flavor an electro flavor you know they'll come with a few things you know you know i've been listening they they'll say you know I've, I've been listening to dead mouse or i've been listening to bernard herman so there's usually something but between the, their their un, their expressing what the score should feel like and what they see the music achieving. Sometimes they want a very light touch. Sometimes they want it to be really front and center. So between all of that, I start to let my imagination run a little wild. Mm. And if, if I feel that it's going to be somewhat electronic, I'll start by creating a, a palette. You know, the way an artist will, will take, a, a painter will take, you know, uh, will, will limit their color set for a particular painting. You know, if you look at, you know, any great painting has a very limited number of colors used profoundly. Right, right. You know, you don't often see, even a Jackson Pollock painting, yeah. uh, any one Jackson Pollock painting has an incredibly narrow set set of, of colors. And, and you'll find that true of anybody, you know. Uh, Warhol usually had like three, sometimes two. And uh, I think it's the same with music. Um, especially when you work in, with electronics a lot, like I do, you have all the capacity of what an orchestra can do color-wise, timbrely. Plus, I mean, really, it's 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 as close to limitless as you can you can get. So the first thing I do is I I choose my narrowness, hmm. and within that, try to develop maybe some unique sounds that that will become so, impart some small bit of signature. 
But then I use those sounds to inspire me thematically, and I start to write music. Mm -hmm. You know, what, I, what I've done on a number of movies is I'll try to come up with four, five, six ideas and write them as like a little mini suite, okay. like a little six, seven minute little, little composition in which no one theme is designed specifically for a particular scene or character. But what I do is I write it with the intent that some or all of it feels like music that could have been in this film. And then I sit and play it for the director and I don't say anything. I just say, tell me what you think of this little suite of sketches and tell me what, what strikes you. Hmm. Invariably, a, a director will say, well, I like that second piece and I could hear that over here and it'll be something that I had never thought of and they'll say you know in that fourth piece I could hear that as being the theme for every time we're at the airport you know whatever yeah. and um, and so after my imagination goes a bit wild but I've I focused it then I allow the the director's imagination to go a bit wild where they'll come up with either they'll be in sync with me where I I always thought that that one theme Number two is going to be the you know the theme for when you know he meets the girl, mm -hmm. um, but I'm always open to, uh, and it's fascinating when a director comes up with a very different view. But invariably, that suite becomes the beginning of a conversation that focuses in on the one or the two or the four pieces that end up being the core to the score. Mm. And, uh, and you've worked with so many prolific directors over your career. Um, and from your experiences uh, from the composing side, uh, what qualities make a good director to work with? What makes you want to be like, I want to work with him or her over and over oh. again? Well, you know, um, the interesting thing about the relationship between a director and a composer is that directors, for the most part, have become very well schooled in all of the technical elements of making a movie. Right. That is, they know enough about cinematography to talk to a their their uh, DP, their their camera person, about lenses and 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 depth of field and, and they can talk to the lighting people about color and and backlighting. They can talk to the makeup people, they can talk to the special effects people, they can talk to the writer about fixing a scene to be to have more pathos, they can talk to actors about playing the scene up or down or what have you. They can direct and choreograph fight sequences. Uh, they can talk to an editor about, about uh, transitions and elements and color timing. Directors come with profound knowledge of all of the craft of making film, but usually not about how to make music. Hmm. I've only worked with one or two directors who were really uh, well-educated as musicians, and typically those are the worst ones to work with. Right, yeah. Because... <laughs> You know, a good director, you know, uh, doesn't tell you how to do your job. They just tell you what they want the results to be. Mm -hmm. And um, to that effect, what I love about any director that I've worked with is when they can express what they do like and what they don't like. And that when they don't like a piece of music, they can in some very, very basic way say why. You know, I've I have found... In some cases, and I have to be very careful about this, you, it takes time to get to know a director well enough, whether you should start from scratch or you actually have the capacity to fix a piece of music that isn't working. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I've found that just playing a piece of music ever so slightly faster takes, takes a piece of music from kind of the, 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 the dump pile to the I love it pile. Mm -hmm. You know, so as long as a director can talk to me in terms of, I need more tension, or I need the tension to build slower, or when she walks out of the room, I really need to feel how she leaves a vacuum. Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of things that allow me to do what I do the best, as opposed to too many minor chords, that, you know, that kind of, that kind of micromanaging. A good director rarely micromanages. They see the big picture in ways that a composer or, or anybody often can't because they know how everything's going to fit together. I may be writing a piece of music for early in the picture, which the director is thinking about how important that scene is when we come back at the end for the twist or the, or the, the, final, you know, the final act. So where I'm trying to express music of a particular moment in time, 
the director may tell me, well, you've overdone it or you've underdone it because they're thinking about the resonance of, of that moment and how it will come back or change uh, due to something later in the, in, the, in the picture. I mean, I do my best to predict those kinds of things, but that's what a director is there for, to make all of these pieces fit together uh, flawlessly. Mm-hmm. So now you're uh, you have the score for the Phantom coming out. Uh, what, yeah. were, what were your goals musically for this specific film? So uh, Phantom is written and directed by uh, Todd Robinson, mm-hmm. and Todd was the writer of Ridley Scott's movie White Squall. Oh yeah, yeah, right. It's, you know about the first thing I ever did, mm-hmm. but I never met Todd. I we we met in passing many many years later when he had written a pilot for some producers. And I was talking about the pilot never got made. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was too expensive. But um, but Todd was a big fan of the music to White Squall. I mean, White Squall was a big deal to him. It was wasn't a big commercial success in the U.S. But it's been around for you know that movie is ninety six. I mean that movie is you know fourteen fifteen years old. So um, you know that movie meant a lot to Todd and. Um, you know, even Ridley kind of scratches his head why the film didn't resonate more with uh, with audiences. I know that it came out on the same day as the World Cup in England, and nobody goes to the movies on uh, that particular Saturday, so that was weird timing. But, um, but uh, Todd, who's only directed one or two movies since, he's written a few things and he's worked on screenplays for other people, but he's only directed once or twice, but he never got a chance to pick a composer until this film. Mm. And he just called me up. He said, you, you know how to create emotion, but you do it in a kind of non-traditional way. Uh, you know, you, you, have a, you, you have a new view of music, but you're not trying to be too clever. You're, you, I want you to score this film. Will you do it? So it's, that's, that's always nice. I didn't, I mean, it was just a phone call one day. <laughs> so um, actually it was a Facebook message one day. So, um, so, uh, you know, Todd uh, had me over to his house. We had a chat. Um, and that's when he told me the story and asked me what I thought. And I threw some ideas at him. And then a week or two later, I wrote a little bit and he liked what I wrote. And, um, and he made it very clear. He said, my job as a director is to pick the right people and let them do what they do and stay out of their way. Um, and, you know, he stayed fairly true to that. I mean, there was the movie went through a lot of changes, um, more so than most movies I've worked on, in that the first cut that I worked on when I started writing was a very uh, meditative, quiet, uh, uh, haunting, mysterious film with a few elements of, of um, action, thriller, suspense, mm-hmm. more suspense. But... You know, after, after, and that was a beautiful version of the movie. And, and I wrote a score, a fair amount of score, that really embodied this very internal uh, idea because, it, you know, Ed Harris plays this rather tortured character, this, this aging Soviet uh, uh, submarine captain who takes this aging Soviet submarine on its last mission and some things happen. You know, that's all, you know, I won't want to give anything away. But um, we see the movie very much from his perspective, but we also know that he has a, at best, a tenuous grasp on reality. We realize that he's not only tortured by his past, but he's, uh, he, has, he suffers from some hallucinations. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes we know when he's hallucinating, sometimes we don't. So, you know... Like with a lot of war movies, it's not a black and white good guy versus bad guy. It's about differences of opinion and about differences of ideology coming into conflict. Right. But, you know, with any ideology, with any, with any political uh, story, um, ideology comes from a belief in what is, what is right or true. Mm-hmm. In this case, we have that, but then we question about what is real and what is true. So, you know, so many decisions in life... Uh, in the political arena get made based on what are considered facts at the time, you know, the weapons of mass destruction sort of thing. We, you know, we acted on what was considered, what we were told was the truth. And uh, in this movie, there's a similar idea of everybody in the movie makes decisions based on what is true, but 
we and in the audience start to understand that what is true uh, unravels very quickly in this world, you know, especially when you're under the ocean in this confined um, bubble that doesn't have the ability to get information. You have to base it on what you came into the story with. So all the characters at the beginning of the story all have uh, what they believe is true and correct and what their actions will be, and and an tr- unbelievable conflict occurs. But as the film went on, um, the, the, the producers all started to feel that there was the roots of a, of a really great suspense thriller in this movie mm-hmm. and that we didn't need to dwell on the this internal story. You could infer it. You didn't need to uh, live in it. So the film started to, to uh, build up emotional steam because it's, you know, the consequences of these beliefs drive the action like they would in any movie. Right. So I had to go back and start rethinking my approach to the score to say that there's a, that there's a clock ticking because time, time will run out, you know, submarines, you know, in, in, in war, you don't get a chance to pick the pace at which, uh, you must act on your decisions. You know, if somebody fires a torpedo at you, you have to decide, are you going to get out of the way? Are you going to f- retaliate? You know, is it, do you fight fire with fire? Do you run? Do you, do you act the diplomat? Do you act the aggressor? Um, that's, you know, that's, that's where, you know, any, any war movie becomes not a reflection of war, but a reflection of people. Right. This movie does that. I think this movie does that incredibly well. So, um, this idea of the ticking clock becomes a major part of the score. And I don't know how much of the score you've listened to, but about halfway through the score, and, and, the, and the soundtrack album is about 80% in, score, in, in the order of the film, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, I rearranged a little bit because I can't leave well enough alone. <laughs> and um, you start to hear this sense of, of, uh, of the ticking clock. And, and that's because... You got to make a decision. You got to make it now. You know what are you going to do? No, I did. I lis- I listened to it and I loved it. It was uh, such, a, and it felt. I mean, when I'm listening to it, it brought me kind of narrowed me down. I guess my my my, my mind of thought process, and I'm just I was just focused on, you know, feeling the story progress and feeling it. You know, moving towards something and something. You know, it was really mm-hmm. well structured. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, you remember, you know, Keanu Reeves in Speed, yeah. you know, an elevator with hostages, there's a bomb, what are you going to do? Right. <laughs> well, you know, and, um, you know, uh, David Mamet, the director, uh, he wrote a, a great book about about filmmaking, and uh, it's called Bambi vs. Godzilla. Mm-hmm. And it's a great book about his experiences as a writer and a director, and it's funny, it's very funny. But in it, he, he has, there's a great thing he says, he says... He said that the um, the key to drama is put all your characters in a tree and then light the tree on fire. <laughs> and you know, I, I mean, who could put it? You, you can't put it any better than that. Right. So, um, so um, in uh, in in Phantom, the score started to develop more into uh, this idea of there's there's a deep emotional core. Uh, it's which is meditative, which is haunting, which is electronic. There's a ticking clock, which is actually made. I, I sampled an actual submarine. Wow! So uh, I went to the set. I I, I walked through this um, Soviet submarine. I realized it's all these metal tubes and pipes and hydraulics and valves. And if you tap them, they all had notes. Mm. So I arranged to get uh, an hour on the sub, and I brought a a, a portable recording system. And I sampled myself with sticks and mallets and hammers and, and uh, uh, pl- hitting and tapping and playing little rhythms all over this submarine. Then I, I sampled in, into my computer. And I, if, even like melodies and chords uh, are built from time stretched and morphed and processed and, and uh, uh, manipulated sounds all made. So about a third of the sounds you hear in the score are made entirely from a submarine. Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> um, and actually, Milan made a little video. There's a little video about it um, on my website, jeffrona.com slash phantom. We embedded it. Uh-huh. 
Um, but I think if you go to Vimeo, it's on, not on YouTube, it's on Vimeo, you can, you can find it. But it's a cool little two-minute uh, mini documentary about uh, using how to write a film score with a submarine. Wow, that's amazing. You know, but then uh, the Calder String Quartet uh, played, and I had some other, I had a lot of celli. I, I stacked celli 20, 20 deep for, for some of it. Um, some other soloists. I had a, a Russian avant-garde guitar player. Right, right. Some cool rhythm and, and ambient sounds. And, and a few other things. There's trumpet, there's piano, there's, I play woodwinds. Uh, and I play this uh, American folk instrument called a marxophone, which is like a, mm. uh, an auto harp with a little spring-loaded keyboard that, that plays these vaguely Russian Eastern, Eastern yeah. sounds. It's really, a, it's a, it's an American instrument, but you know, ironically called a marxophone. <laughs> and yeah, there is there's a bit of Russian flavoring to the music, and and I mean, in all of your uh, not all, but a lot of your scores, they do, you do uh, use ethnic instrumentation. So how, how do you like to incorporate that into the storytelling? Is it more of a character stamp, or do you really <laughs> want to establish just the setting of the film and where the story is taking place? You know, more more often than not, any time I've used any kind of world music. Uh, or instrument, I've often used it in contrast to any setting in the movie. Hmm. Um, so, uh, well, White Squall, even though it takes place in the Caribbean, I used uh, gamelons and uh, Celtic instruments. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Um, only because they sort of spoke of the ocean to me. Um, you know, there was nothing specifically Russian, except I did reference an ancient Georgian choral piece. Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, I listened, you know, I listened to some Russian music and, and nothing moved me more than this thousand year old hymn sung by, typically sung by an all male Georgian choir. And that, it's a style of choral singing, uh, where they sing very, very quietly and very high voices and mm -hmm. beautiful harmonies that you hear still in Russian music and, and in Eastern European music, Balkan music. And this particular piece um, and I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the name. <clears throat> I, could, I could look it up. Um, I'd heard once before because Kate Bush referenced it briefly in, uh, on a cut on The Hounds of Love. Hmm. Uh, you know, her album from the late 70s, early 80s, I think late 70s. And um, Haunting Then, Haunting Now. You don't, I didn't use it. I just... I, I was sort of inspired by it, and I used a, a little bit of it as as just a slight bit of, of of reference, but sort of filtered off into the distance and and more sort of like thinking of it as memory. It's a memory of 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 Russia, not an expression of of Russia Soviet music. Right, right. right. Well, uh, I guess to wrap things up, I always like to uh, to ask composers uh, this one question. Uh, if you had the opportunity to score any film ever made, with no disrespect to the original composer, which film would you choose? Oh my God! <laughs> um, boy, have you always gotten in straight answers? Uh, there, uh, <laughs> and I, I knew a composer who gave me an answer and then emailed me a change to his answer two days later. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh God, I have. You know, I love film music. I love the world of film, of, of, of writing music to picture. I, I've rarely heard a, a score. I mean, I would probably reference films whose scores I love the most. Right, than yeah, one yeah. I think, oh, my God, that was a lost opportunity, you know? I mean, oh, yeah, I'd, yeah. Love to, I'd score Taxi Driver in a heartbeat. No. But that also, <laughs> at the same time is, you know, maybe in my top five favorite scores of all time, you know? Of course, yeah. I'd probably only want to score movies whose scores were in my top, you know, ten list. And, and um, you know, a lot of them would be Bernard Herrmann. Um, you know, so uh, just because he, he understood sort of, he was sort of the father of atmospheric film scoring, wasn't he? You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nobody did what he did. Um you know, The Day the Earth Stood Still is still one of my favorite scores, Absolutely. only because he was willing to hold a single chord for almost 10 minutes <laughs> while the ship landed. And it was this just one ever so slightly dissonant, unpleasant chord, and he just sat there. And who else would have done that? Right. right. 
So I took your question and I just turned it into a, a, a Valentine's Day love letter to, to Bernard Herrmann. <laughs> Which is very appropriate for today. <laughs> you know, he, yeah, he, he, he was really, uh, to, to my ear, the first really personal, really personal film composer. Well, that's a, a great no. answer. I like, I like that. <laughs> so, but, so I'll probably end up sending you an email later today saying, you know, now that I think about it, I really wish I'd said Mary Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll put an asterisk if you, uh, to the interview if you send me a new answer. <laughs> Would you? Thank you. By the way, thank you so much for doing this. You know, um, you know you're one of those, those uh, rare people who, who comes with a very, very uh, uh, astute ear for music you know, and, and who's willing to, to share very freely. And I know you do this all on your own time that you, you share very freely your own insight to, and, and love of, of music for film. And, uh, it's really, uh, I can't thank you enough for, uh, ringing me up and, uh, and, and, and talking and let's talk again. Oh, absolutely. And thank you for writing the music because without it, I would not, have uh, anything to be really fond of. So. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. And I guess I'll just say that I, I don't know when this will post, but uh, Phantom opens, uh, I think it opens on March 1st, mm -hmm. and which is in a couple of weeks. And the film, the score is on Milan coming out just a couple of days before. And it's on CD and on, uh, uh, you know, iTunes and all the downloads. And um, there's going to be a limited uh, edition of signed uh, CDs, which are going to be on my website around the same time at, uh, if I may, jeffrana.com. So that'll, they'll, they'll be there in a, in a week or two. Anyway, thank you so much. I really appreciate it a lot. It's a pleasure. Absolutely.